Amen. Haven't the sessions been amazing? Man, Trisha's session was awesome. Um, Ryan's session was awesome. And then last night was life-changing. Absolutely was. I was telling, um, I was telling him this morning that, uh, um, you know, last night wasn't a message. It was an encounter with the heart of God and the purpose of God. And, uh, and I have an understanding of glory. I didn't really, I don't, I'm, I've been in this for 20 years, and I didn't really understand what the glory was until last night. It's kind of sad, I guess, but praise God I made it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know what it is now, but praise the Lord. Because, you know, people would teach on it, and it would just be weird and, like, esoterical, and it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't impact. I, I want to know what works in my daily life. I'm very practical. Like, I want, don't give me a bunch of weird language that I don't know what you're talking about. And so when people would preach on the glory, I'd be like, oh, great, the glory, jeez. Which I know is a horrible thing to say, but you know what I'm saying? Are you flippantly speaking of the glory of God? Do you know? But I mean, like, it was just weird. And like, I finally understand what it is now, you know? And uh, it took me 20 years, praise God. But I'm here, and uh, it was awesome. And now I understand uh, that's what we're doing down here. That's our purpose. I'm pressing my face up against the fence too now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I understand now. Um, amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then, anyway, I'm not going to get into all that. But you know what I really want to know? What kind of hair gel does Ryan Rufus use? All right. Because, like, this guy, okay, which best teaching I've ever heard on getting free from the dominion of sin. It was amazing, but let's address his hair for just a second. Just a minute. I mean, sin's beating him up, right? I can't even flick my head like he flicked his head, because if I do, my hair will be like this for the rest of the day. Y'all see Brother Johnson out here? I'll just be like... So he does that. His hair goes forward. With one flick of his head, it goes straight back every single hair in place. Like, the message was awesome. It was amazing. But I'm watching his hair like, how did he do that? So, for real, what kind of hair gel do you use? Okay, all right. All right. I just, I like, I'm genuinely curious, you know. He's like, no, it's, it's the glory. <laughs> like, it was perfect. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Did anybody else have that thought? All right, thank you. Did anybody covet it a little bit? Anybody sin when they saw it? Okay. All right. Yeah, All right. I appreciate that, brother. <laughs> oh, Lord, that's funny. Hallelujah. You know what? I came to Alabama, and the barbecue knew my name. But after four days, you know what I said to the barbecue? I'm done. I'm done. I'm just done. I'm done. Ah. Did anybody not see Ryan's session? Because if you did, okay, you're thinking, what is wrong with these people? Like, why are they, what are they even talking about? Watch it, and then you'll laugh, and you'll think it's really funny. Ah. Hey, man, it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> hey, man, how many of you know laughter does good like a medicine? Hey, Amen. We're supposed to be laughing and having a good time. Hey, Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. We love you, Lord. You know, usually, um, I, I can't, st- you're, you continue to laugh, and it's like pulling on my laugh. So keep going. Just keep going. It's all good. It's all good. It's good. It's, um, it's the voice of our spirits. You know what I'm saying? It's joy. You know? It's, it's a healthy thing. Amen? We need to laugh. We need to enjoy life. How many of we won? Did we not win? Is the game not over? You know what I'm saying? We're living in a 2,000-year-old victory. Strolling. We're, this is the victory lap. Do you know this life is the victory lap? On our way to eternity. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, let's enjoy the ride. Amen. Days of heaven on earth. Amen. Let's have fun. Praise God. Amen. But uh, we uh, usually when I when I minister, um, God will give me you know something to say you know give me a message and then He'll give me something different to share later in the week. Uh, but man, I just I'm, I'm I just really feel led to uh, continue down that same path that I was on, and this kind of where God's had me at. He's had me at this in my home church. Um, I just feel like I'm on the pinnacle, or not the pinnacle, but the tip of the iceberg. Um, to un, unle- uh, allowing grace um, to unleash just supernatural great faith in the people of God, and not from a standpoint of sweating, not from the standpoint of trying or working real hard at it, but just from the reality of Jesus Christ. You know, there's no reason why we can't all have great faith, you know, because uh, it's really not our, it's not us, it's Him. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. So, I'm just going to go right down that same same stream this morning. So, I just want to pray because I want to want to uh, I just want to do that. Father, we just thank you for these people. Lord, I ask you to help me to care about them the way you do. Let me love them. Let me uh, let me feel your heart for them. Let me care about their lives, their future, their destiny. Lord, I thank you this is not just a speech, it's not just a performance, but this is me having the honor of loving your people um, through your words. And Spirit of God, we recognize that you're the teacher, um, and I thank you that you teach us tonight. You show us Jesus tonight and uh, in such a way that we'll, we'll receive pieces of the puzzle that we didn't have before, Lord, giving us a greater understanding of things that we already know. But, um, Lord, just um, taking us to a a clearer place. And, Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Now, I just want to, I want to say this. Um, A message of disqualification will not bring faith. A message of disqualification will not bring faith. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Well, um, how many know that when the Bible says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, and you know, how many of y'all have spent a portion of your lives pursuing the inc- increasing your faith? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like I used to, I was in church, we'd be in church, you know, five days a week, four hours of service, not an exaggeration, um, trying to get great faith. And we would study in Scripture, and we would pray, and we would fast, and we would go to conferences, and we would get people to lay hands on us, and we would, uh, I was pursuing it with all that I had, but the harder I worked to get it, the smaller it became. Because, um, you know, and I talked about this in my session, uh, the last session, the purpose of faith is to see Jesus and ultimately to receive a gift that you didn't earn and you didn't deserve, okay? And so if you try to earn anything from God, you, you might as well throw your faith out the window because if you're earning it, then you don't have to believe for it. And we all have to be very careful because we live in a world where we earn everything. And that's not a bad thing, you know. Um, you know, I mean, it's how life is. You know, you work hard, there's an element of reward to it. You're, you know, you're faithful, there's an element of reward to it. You are consistent, you're diligent. There's, these are all wonderful things and great principles. We want to instill them into our children. Um, we want these things. We want integrity and we want... Um, character, and we want um, consistency, and these things are very good and very healthy. The character of Christ, amen. Um, but there, there is a uh, since the fall of man, what has entered into our, our, you know, how many know the garden was a gift? They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. How many know life was a gift? Um, how many know Eve was a gift to Adam? Adam was a gift to Eve. Um, everything began as a loving father freely 
lovingly giving a gift and man receiving that gift, enjoying that gift, and glorifying the giver of the gift. Beautiful picture, right? But when the fall of man happened, uh, you know, and the curse came, no longer were, were the, the earth came under a curse and we entered into a meritocracy where we labored and sweated and toiled and strived to survive, okay? That the, the, the first Adam brought us into that state. And so in the mind of man, the natural inclination of the mind of man, the carnal mind is, um, operates in a system of earning, in a system of debt. Um, but then Jesus came, and how many know he is freely, God has given us freely all things through Jesus, right? So now we've been brought back to that place of Eden, that place of heaven, that place of gift, that place of father, um, you know, God's not your employer, amen, he is your father, and he gave us faith to make it easy, okay, to, uh, to, it's the ease of simply receiving a gift, and so, um, you know, the Jews, of course, labored for, for you know, and we, we see this exemplified in Abraham's life, and we see, we see Abraham become the father of our faith, become a person of great faith, um, because he's under grace, amen, I mean, you know, grace will cultivate trust. How does it do it? Well, if I'm good to you, no matter what, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter whether you're good to me back or not, if I'm good to you, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, eventually you're going to trust me. And you're going to actually, you're going to love me. And you're going to believe what I say. So that's why it's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance, leads man to change, because in an atmosphere of grace, trust will arise. We see it in Abraham's life. How many know Abraham believed God? He trusted him. Uh, why? Because he, God gave him no reason to do anything else, because God was so good to Abraham. So in an atmosphere of grace, faith will arise to the occasion and take the gift that's freely given. And it's beautiful, and it's fun, and it's awesome. But when we are trying to labor, to earn, and to deserve, even in the name of faith, we leave the realm of relationship with the Father. We enter into a business transaction. He becomes an employer, and now God, you know, now in our minds we think God blesses us when we deserve it. God blesses us when we earn it. God blesses us when we do everything that's right. I mean, you know, that puts us in control of God's pockets. And when I get blessed, it's because I'm awesome, not because he's awesome. You know, and, and I, the example I give a lot that I, that I think helps us understand this, if I got a 13-year-old son, if he comes to me at the end of this year and says, Dad, I'm going to earn every single gift under that Christmas tree this year. Every gift, I'm going to earn it. I'm going to deserve it. You're going to owe me everything because I'm going to be so good and so amazing. You're going to have to pay me all the gifts. Now, how many know that he has robbed me of the joy of being a loving father, and he's robbed himself of being loved? And so rather than enjoying Christmas, it becomes a business transaction. And when Christmas Day comes and the gifts are given, I am handing him a paycheck that he earned with his behavior. And you know whose goodness is on display? His, not mine. And so that's the old covenant. That entire mentality is the old covenant. God found fault with that covenant. Why? It tied God's hands and kept God from, from blessing when he wanted to bless. The blessing was actually based on man's efforts. When you did good, you got good. When you did bad, you got bad. And when you messed up, something had to die. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And God said, hey, man, you know, and God found fault with the covenant, not because there's anything wrong with the covenant, because God's standard of righteousness and holiness is at the apex of all creation. But it, we found fault with it because it kept him from blessing us. And that's why I said, here, let me, let me pull this guy out of the back 40 worshiping the moon named Abraham. Let me pull him out, and I'm just going to pull this guy out, and I'm going to whoosh, 
unleash all my goodness on him like a flood. And I'm going to overwhelm him to where faith just arises in his heart. And he becomes a man of great faith, not because he's awesome, but because I'm so awesome and so good that he's fallen in love with me and he'll trust me even to give me the ultimate act of obedience. When I ask of him the very thing he loves the most, he will immediately listen to me because he trusts me because he's known nothing but my goodness. Because I am the author and finisher of his faith. He's not the author and finisher. I am. And I feel like the Lord is saying to the church, let me show you how good I am. Let me bless you. Let me pour out blessings. Let me overwhelm you with my goodness. Get in the line of grace. Come to the throne of grace. Get out of the line of earning it not looking for first hour workers laboring in the sun deserving a paycheck from me. I want you to be the one hour worker, the 11th hour worker. I want to bless you and be good to you, not because of you, but because of me. Let me do it. And like you shared last night, we're offended at that. I don't want that. I want what I deserve. I want what I earn. And that's what I want. And if that's the way you want it, that's the way you'll get it. But don't be shocked when the drug addict, alcoholic, crackhead, crazy people step in front of you in line and receive all the healing, all the blessing, all the goodness, and they know they haven't earned it, they know they don't deserve it, and they drop to their knees and glorify the Lord of glory because He is good. And we can't stand here in the back of the line having labored the entire day with a first hour worker mentality finding fault with the goodness of God because he didn't lay out paychecks the way we thought he should lay out paychecks. Nothing that comes from God is a paycheck. It's all for free. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. The price has been paid in full by the Son of God. So will you allow him to overwhelm you with his goodness? The only, there's a price though. I thought it was free. Well, you're going to have to, and this goes t- ties into what Rob was sharing last night. You have to lay down all your pride. Because no flesh will boast. I'm not talking about your physical flesh. That's talking about your carnal, the carnal mind, the earning it system, the meritocracy. So if you're willing to lay down yourself and take up the Christ and stop trying to cut side covenants with God based on your obedience and your fasting and your prayer and all these things, nothing against those things, but let's put them in the right context and just enjoy the covenant that was cut with for you. Jesus Christ and come to the Father based on Jesus' obedience and not your physical obedience. So that the reason we've been given faith is so that boasting can be removed. And yet we foolishly have boasted in how big our faith was. How have we managed to figure out how to mess it up? <laughs> yeah, you know, we had seasons of I'm a man of great faith. Your faith is small. For three easy payments of $19.99, you too can have big faith like me. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'm sorry. (laughs) Praise God. God gave us faith so we couldn't break. Because, you know, the drug addict, alcoholic, crackhead knows they have nothing to boast in. So you know what? It's, faith is actually easier for them because they have nothing to bring to the table. But as the church of Jesus Christ, we're going to have to learn how to mature in grace and not to begin in the Spirit and work our way into the flesh trying to earn something that's free. Don't you think we should get better at this? 
You know what I'm saying? Don't, we should mature. We should get our hearts established in grace so that even though I may be laboring in the field for years and years, I can maintain an 11th hour worker mentality so that I am boasting in the goodness of my Father and not the works of my own hands. <sighs> Amen. And so any message that disqualifies does not bring faith. The old covenant was a disqualification message. You know? Oh, nope, not qualified, not qualified, not qualified. I'm glad I wasn't born in the old covenant. I would not have lasted long. Jeremiah was born, he got smoked. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Been a short book, three lines. Brother Johnson needs grace. Hallelujah. You know? Amen. Under the old covenant, I mean, you couldn't be a priest if you had a mole or something. You know what I'm saying? Or just like anything. <laughs> It was a message of disqualification. Amen. But then you see Jesus hit the scene. Different than Moses. Full of grace and truth. And the sinners are like, who is this man? And they flock to him. You can't keep the sinners away from Jesus. Without social media, without radio, without any of those things, Jesus comes to town and the sinners come out in droves. They rip, they rip roofs off of houses to get to this man because he was the yes. His message is not yes and no. His message is yes. Can I be healed? Yes. Can I be saved? Yes. Can I be prospered? Yes. Can I be protected? Yes. He is the yes from God. All the promises are yes and amen in him. But we, what we do with, through legalism is we get taught how to have a mentality outside of him. And instead of running to the throne of grace... We crawl when we think we've earned it or deserved it. Listen, you never earn it or deserve it, ever. Listen, there's not anyone in this room that's any better than anybody else. Can I get an amen? How many of you know that this row is not more holy than this row? And this row is not more holy than this row. All the way back to those guys we're hoping are saved in the sound booth. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Are they saved, Lord? No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. But, you know, we have this mentality of, of this, you know, this concept of earning. Now, certainly there's leadership and, and things of that nature. We don't do away with that. But how many of the purpose of being a leader is to serve anyway? I'm standing here before you preaching a gift I did not earn, I do not deserve, and it wasn't given to exalt me. It was actually given to serve people with... I'm still surprised I'm here. I'm thankful I'm saved. You know what I'm saying? Like, praise God. Drug addict, alcoholic, atheist, God plucked me up and set me up here, you know, to run my mouth to serve people. But no one in this room is any more deserving than anybody else. Isn't that amazing? We need to know that. We're kids. We're children of God. Firstborn, all of us, right? And so we, but in our concept of... Uh, meritocracy, we seek many times to disqualify ourselves and disqualify others when Jesus never did that. We want to pick and choose who can be healed. We want to pick and choose who can be blessed. No, no. Jesus walked around. He was the yes. So, in order for faith to arise to its proper place, you're going to have to realize that you're qualified to receive and you didn't qualify you. And you don't disqualify you. Can I get an amen? So come get it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, the, the two people we see in the Bible that have great faith were both Gentiles. They came with a mindset of no disqualification. The Samaritan and, and the, um, uh, the Samaritan woman and the centurion, they did not come with a I can't say God's name out loud mentality. 
like the Jews had. They didn't come with a disqualification. They came with, hey, man, this guy, he's, he's a, this, is a, this guy right here, Jesus, he's a hero. He's a Messiah. He's the Christ. He saves. And so, as a result, they didn't spend years trying to get great faith like me. They didn't spend years in, you know, all the things that we tried to do. They weren't praying. They weren't fasting. You know, the brother wasn't even circumcised. Hallelujah. Samaritan woman was lying. If you look at the way she approached him, she, would tr- she was not approaching him out of a place of genuineness. She's trying to trick him into healing her. And that's why he let her know, hey, I know who you are. And that's why it seems like he was rough with her, but he actually wasn't. He wanted her to be real. You know why he wanted to be real? Because the reason God so anti-hypocrisy is because when you're operating fakely, you won't actually receive love. Because you don't think you're worthy of real love because you think the real you's dirty. That's why hypocrisy is evil in the eyes of God. Because uh, God says, I, take that mask off. Let me see you. Okay? Just the way you are. With your mistakes, with your flaws. I love you. Let's experience that. And so he took her mask off with some quick truth. You know? And when she took it off, um, she re- and, and so... How many know they both had great faith? Amazing, isn't it? What's the difference? Well, they weren't disqualifying themselves from receiving. And many of us, we've spent years learning how we're not qualified. Under the new covenant, we basically, we have we, we, our, our primary obedience, and there is an obedience in the new covenant, but it's the obedience of faith. Belief. That's your obedience. Because when you believe properly, everything else will be taken care of. God said, I'm not, look, I'm not looking at all this outside stuff. I just want your heart. You give me your heart, everything else will be taken care of. So the new covenant, the obedience is an obedience of faith. So what does that mean? Well, we need to believe that Jesus did a good job. <laughs> That's it. Because, listen... And, and we'd spent, you know, we spent hours, you know, loving and worshiping the Lord and being so thankful for Him. But if you think you're unworthy to receive, you're saying He didn't do a good job. Let that hit home for just a minute. When you think you're not righteous or not right with God or God's going to punish you for your sin, you're saying He did not do a good job. And we were taught that that was somehow spiritual and somehow a good thing, that false, nasty humility that man-made religion teaches. You're not a worm. Okay? And so you're going to have to lay down those filthy rags of self-righteousness and put on the robe and stand up like a king's kid. Own the identity that's been given to you. Because here's the thing, if you're not worthy, then he's not worthy. Is he worthy? Where are you? In him, right? And he's in you, right? He's cleansed you to the point that you are just as holy in here as the holy of holies. So why in the world are we walking around feeling as though we're not worthy? And I think we settle the issue, at least in these circles, with het, with, in terms of the afterlife. But we've got to settle the issue with the promises of God. And see, the challenge with the promises, uh, so it's through faith and patience you inherit the promise. There's times when that promise don't come like that. It didn't even happen in Abraham's life. There were things God promised him didn't come for years. And so in the passage of time, the enemy will try to ravage your identity. He will come at you and attack you and tempt you and try to get you to make mistakes. And when you make those mistakes, he wants you to identify with those mistakes and own those mistakes and take them into yourself. So as the passage of time happens and as you you rise and as you fall and as you make mistakes and all the things that you do, how many know Abraham made some mistakes? But his mistakes did not define him the goodness of God defined his life. 
And so as, the, as you're waiting for healing to manifest, as you're waiting for financial miracles to happen, as you're waiting for all the things that you're waiting for, because everybody in here is waiting for something. And if you're not, you should be. Because this book's filled with promises, and you're not in this life by yourself and on your own. You've got a God that's bigger than anything that you're facing, and it's his joy to give you the kingdom. A part of this walk is getting answered prayer. Part of this walk is getting miracles and signs and wonders and, and the hand of God signing his name. He loves it. So as the passage of time happens, hold fast to your identity in Christ. Don't let go of who you are. That's the primary purpose of your faith. What is your identity? Christ. As he is, so are we in this world. Now, how many know he's the head? You will never be the head. Can I get an amen? You were teaching on that, and it's very important because people get weird with stuff like that. You're not the head. We'll never be the head. But we are the body. Can I get an amen? He's the boss, but we're in him now. And so we need to identify with him. You use your faith to believe that Christ is in you, and you are in Christ, and that you're the righteousness of God. Okay? And listen. <laughs> We don't have this yet to the level that we can. Here's the challenge. We think that because we can answer it on the multiple choice test that we have it. Am I the righteousness of God, true or false, true? Is there no condemnation of Christ Jesus, true? <laughs> Amen. But it needs to be established in the backdrop of your mind. It needs to be established in your subconscious, your conscious mind, your thought processes, your entire being should be consumed with the fact that you're the righteousness of God, that you're clean, that you're just as righteous as Jesus is, okay? Because that is what call that understanding. We are the door that the Lord of glory walks through. Condemnation shuts the door. It doesn't remove the Christ, but it removes the presentation of the Christ. How many of you know there's a veil that covers his face called condemnation? Keep the veil rent. Get your heart established in righteousness. You know, if we pursued this reality as much as we pursue other things, what if I pursued the kingdom of God and his righteousness more than I pursued money? I mean, we spend time, you know, 40 hours a week, whatever, pursuing money. What if, I, what if I chose wisdom above that? I'm not saying quit your job, but I'm saying like this reality of the righteousness of God needs to be more than a, than a Sunday morning patty cake. We need to get it established in our hearts and our mind because when it becomes resident in you, you are actually keeping your end of the new covenant, the obedience of faith. Because you're saying with your life, with your mind, Jesus did a good job. It's all God's looking for anyway. So, you're going to have to not allow condemnation to rule your thoughts any longer. Jesus did a good job. God loves you. God is for you. His answer towards you is yes. You know, when the leper was looking to get cleansed, Jesus didn't look at his history. Well, how much, how much sin did you do for that leprosy hit you? You know? He didn't come and, 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 and quiz him about his conduct. And the leper knew that Jesus could heal him. He just didn't know he would. And that's, that's the way it is with most folks. God, I know you're powerful enough to fix my situation. I'm just not sure you're going to do it for me. Because I'm not worthy. Because of what I have done. Listen, you and me, you are not called to focus on you. This is not about you. You focus on him. He made you worthy. He made you righteous. Amen. Amen. Run boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. You do see, and so under the new covenant, how many know that 
And, and I feel like we've been, we've been almost scared to preach this because we feel like we're just telling people, hey, do whatever you want to do. God's going to bless you. Listen, bad conduct still has bad repercussions. It's not punishment. It's just repercussions. If I, leave, you know, if I leave this place and go out and peel out of the parking lot in my truck and you know, go 120 miles an hour back to the hotel, how many old Jesus loves me? How many know I'm forgiven? How many I'm about to get a ticket? <laughs> Amen. I'm about to get embarrassed. But how many know that after that ticket happens, that I'm still qualified to be blessed? Before the ticket, during the ticket, and after the ticket, I'm still the righteousness of God. You know why? Jesus did a good job on the cross. My conduct did not save me. My conduct does not keep me saved. My faith allows me to joy, enjoy what he paid for. So please understand, I'm like giving you a hard pass on being an idiot. I'm not. I'm not. But I'm saying like, it's time to quit tiptoeing around this reality. It's time to just put the throttle back, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, let the chips fall where they may, let them call you what they want to call you, let them slander you and speak bad about you. Who cares? Did our king pay for this gospel? Did it cost heaven everything to make us righteous? Then let's represent it in the earth without compromise. And let's see the blessing of God be poured out on the people of God. So that our influence will increase. So that we will take our position of as heirs of the world. Own it. It's yours. It's not theirs. It's not the government's. It's not the entertainment industry. This is our world. Because he gave it to you. And it's his right. So when you walk into Walmart, when you walk into the grocery store, own it. Their atmosphere is not greater than what's on the inside of you. You affect them. They don't affect you. But if you walk in there in condemnation, feeling like God's mad at you, feeling like you're not worthy, then you're carrying the ark, but there's a veil over the holy of holies. And it's time to rent the veil and keep the veil rent. How do I do it, Jeremiah? You say what God said about you. I am the righteousness of God. I am a child of God. All the time, every day, you're the, the, you bear witness to the work of the cross. When you take communion, you bear witness to the fact, this is the blood that cleansed me. This is the body that was broken for me. I don't take it guilty. I take it righteous. So that this robust, powerful, world-overcoming faith would arise in the hearts of God's people, and we would finally be the peculiar treasure. We would finally stand out. We would finally have dominion. We would finally bear rule, be ambassadors of a kingdom greater than all the governments in the earth. And we would stand out and have influence. I'd hate to have finished my course and not ever tasted of this place. I would hate to finish my course and not have the opportunity to have honored the work of the cross properly and living in a state of no condemnation. I'm telling you right now, don't put up with it. Any tongue of judgment tries to arise to condemn you, you condemn it. Listen, God is not going to condemn it for you. I'm so sorry. He said, look, I already stamped you innocent. You're going to have to condemn the tongues. I did the work, but you're going to have to believe it and stand by and condemn those tongues of judgment. Attack it. Be aggressive against it. The condemner has no right to condemn you. So stay in a state of being qualified. Stay in a state of being the yes and the amen, being in him. It's all yours. Every single bit of it. Now there's a time where you pass that place in patience as you await for the manifestation. What do you do while you're there, Jeremiah? Spirit of faith speaketh. Say what God said about you. It'll change everything in your life. It'll change your marriage. You know how to fix a marriage? Get condemnation out. 
You know why, you know why relationships fail? Because we're trying to keep each other in debt. I'll do something good for you, but you got to do something good for me. I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. That's garbage. That's not love. That's a business transaction. You don't need that in your house. You need to love someone unconditionally because you've been loved unconditionally. Can I get an amen? You got to pull your relationships out of legalism. You got to pull them out of debt. There's got to be an overflow. We got to put the tree of life in our house, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The carnal mind exacts debt. The carnal mind tries to earn it. We don't want the carnal mind. It brings death. Brings de- it brings death in the unsaved. It brings death in the saved. It will impact your marriage. It will impact your children. It will impact your finances. Do you know where the righteousness of God dwells that money is attracted to it? Big time. How do you know, Jeremiah? Because they dropped the ark off in some dude's house, and three months later, he was so blessed, the whole nation's like, whoa, 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 we're going to have to get that thing. Yeah, sorry, bro, we're taking this with us. You are carrying that same ark. It's inside of you. Your only job, keep the veil rent, believe correctly, honor the cross. You're the righteousness of God. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. Don't you talk you out of it. Put your shoulders back. Spring in your step. (sighs) And then what I see, and now I finally understand, because of what Rob was preaching last night, is because, (sighs) praise God. Thank you, Lord. The ministry of of condemnation, that glory is passing away. The ministry of righteousness is the ministry of the Spirit, and it exceeds in glory. We can't bring the glory, or uh, the glory's here, but we can't unleash the glory as long as we're prideful, okay? Because when we're prideful, we're being self-righteous, and we don't understand the cross, and we're not honoring Jesus, the thing that will set you free from pride is when you believe the gospel because you have, we have nothing of ourselves. He has given us everything. Do you know pride is self-righteousness? This is the only way out to get us cleansed from ourselves and cleansed from pride. And see, the absence of pride does not mean the absence of confidence. The absence of pride means the absence of self-occupation and self-exaltation. When true godly confidence is present, it will edify everybody in the room. When a carnal carnal confidence is there, which is pride, it makes other people feel low and feel like they're not as good. Pride is what separates us. It's It's what causes disunity in our fellowship and our relationship when we think one person's better than somebody else or one group is better than somebody else. That's not the glory. That's not the kingdom. That's not the unity. It is this powerful gospel that's, and I just see it, just, it's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Like it just breaks that pride off of your life so that you are not, a, not even, you just forget about you. You know what I'm saying? Like your greatest moments are when you are not thinking about yourself. Do you know that is why love has come? How many know love is the only thing that sets you free from you? Because when you are being loved properly, you are fearless. And when love is flowing through you properly, you're not thinking about you. You're focused on somebody else. You want to be confident? Stop thinking about you. When you are self-conscious, you're self-consumed, and you're not confident because you're thinking about you. It's not about you. It's not about you because it is about you. You understand what I'm saying? Because like he loves you and he wants to save you and he wants to set you free from you. It's the greatest freedom you'll ever have. (laughs) Because we can't talk. And so in order, so this only thing that removes pride is the gospel. It just knocks it out of you. And you have to to understand on on the other side too, condemnation and feeling bad about yourself and and self-loathing and unworthiness. Ladies and gentlemen, that's self-righteous. Do you know that? Listen, 
You have no right to judge yourself. You lost every right. We talking about Paul and Paul said, I don't judge myself. Why? God judged you already, and he put the gavel down and called you righteous. You don't have the right to do it anymore. So stop. <laughs> Amen? No, none of this unworthiness, none of this groveling, and also none of this, the other end of the spectrum, pride in thinking you're awesome. There's nothing that any of us do that has any worth that didn't come from God. Nothing, okay? Reality check. Amen? And so, praise God. And so what the gospel does, we're cleansed in the spirit, and God's looking to renew our minds to this reality so we can have the spiritual mind, which is life and peace, so that we can have what, well, what the Welsh revival had, so that we can have the manifestation of the glory. So keep preaching the gospel. Keep believing the gospel. Don't see this is which is what I'm I'm wrapping up. This is we get so we because we think we know the answer. Am I the righteousness of God true or false? True. Got that. Need to move on to something deeper. And then people get bored with the gospel. Like, I know that message. Give me something, you know, about the six Jewish feasts and fasting and prayer and give me something I can get some credit in because uh This gospel thing, I got it. (sighs) Now listen, please understand, we build wisdom on the foundation of the gospel. So I'm not being critical in any shape, form, or fashion. How many know Paul preached behavior modification after he laid the foundation of the gospel? He said, let me show you what love looks like. It's not stealing. (laughs) You know, let me show you what love looks like. It's honoring your, your parents. So please understand, I'm not saying there's not a place for it, But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the feast is the Christ. The life is the Christ. This is the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. Keep preaching the gospel. And I'll tell you what else that I I see coming. We've been teaching it, and that's extremely important. But there's a place of the simple declaration. Preachers of righteousness, the proclamation. I know everybody has different gifts, but there's something that happens when it's, when it's proclaimed. Because this righteousness, this peace, it's an aggressive peace. It's an aggressive victory. There is a call to arms, if you will. Amen. And, and, uh, we, and, and so, yeah. <laughs> Woo. Oh, man. Love you guys. Thank you.